All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. Students online as well. Welcome, welcome. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we'll get into our teaching sessions for today. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for yet another new day, a new week in our lives, oh God. What a privilege it is to come together and to learn your word. And even as we learn about the local church, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bring direction, you will give us wisdom, you will give us the grace to understand and to learn and to apply it in our lives, oh God. We thank you. We come at this teaching sessions into your hands, oh God. Teach us, Lord, through the anointing of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So last class we completed chapter 5. Now I just realized that we may have to go a little quick. Right, so uh, we get into chapter six, but we'll try and cover as much as we can. There will be places where I will uh, just move on quickly, and I do it deliberately. But if there are places where I'll stay and just spend some time there, okay? <coughs> Sorry. So let's get into uh, chapter six: church growth principles. Now, God desires that all of us be fruitful. Right now, we start a church. Obviously, we want to see the church grow. Right? None of us, uh, whether it's a church, whether it's a life group, even in our own personal lives, we want to see fruit in our life. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you'll bear no fruit. Right? So Jesus is exhorting us. He's saying, in your lives, in your work, in your ministries, we must bear fruit. If not, we'll cut it and it's to be thrown in the fire. So church growth happens with through you know one of the most important ways that we must understand church growth happens is a combination of spiritual and natural efforts now we remember in uh, uh, in the other in the previous early chapters we talked about the natural dimensions and the spiritual dimensions right now in in church growth principles if we want to see church growth we've got the natural element where we have to do some work we also have the spiritual. Now, many times we say the spiritual is very important, right? We must be anointed of God, and the anointing will do all the work. True, right? We need the anointing of God. We cannot do it by ourselves. But we, what is the point of having the anointing and not doing anything about it? Is there any use? I always use this example. First Kings, I think it's First Kings 18, where Elijah... Is praying. God tells, sorry, God tells Elijah, go and tell King Ahab, it's going to rain. In the spiritual, it was already done. God had said it's going to rain. It's been three, almost three years now that there's no rain in the land of Israel. So God tells Elijah, it's going to rain. Interestingly, Elijah goes back and prays for that to happen. Perfect example of spiritual and natural efforts. Spiritually, God had already said it's going to rain. Elijah went, prayed, and the rain came. I always think about this. What if Elijah didn't go and pray? Would it have rained? Because God already said it's going to rain. Right? So, the, so it's very important for us when it comes to church growth to combine natural and spiritual effort. So let's look at a few points here, right, um, on your notes. Have a vision for a larger growing church. Now, vision is very important. Vision is the language of the Holy Spirit. You must see your church in your spirit uh, even before it comes to reality, right? Uh, you must see, you must picture it. All of us have an imagination. God gives us, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to see visions and dreams, right? So picture what you want to see. Now, for example, who wants to start a church here? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, Vimal, so for example, Vimal. Vimal, you're going to start a church. Now, in your mind, the church, you're sitting in Bible college now, but in your mind, you should Picture yourself, maybe what, 35 years old or 40 years old. I'm just giving you an example, right? 40 years and 1,000 people sitting in front, front of you. Now, 
will i tell you don't 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 think of that don't dream that do i have the right to tell you that no it's something that you it's a vision that god is putting or you you are thinking about it so that's why vision is powerful nobody can stop you from dreaming big right you can dream and say oh, one day i want to start five a church and then 5000 people should be there in the church can i stop you from dreaming that now it's good to have a dream but if it's not put on paper not put on work what will happen will it work it will be a dream only correct right so we have heard of that saying no all all big dreams he has <laughs> right it's okay to dream big but put it into practice right now you may be so you are sitting here in bible college but you are looking ahead way ahead 10 years 20 years down the line if the rapture doesn't happen this is how my church should be nobody can stop you from dreaming big right so again you can you should also be able to apply it in your personal life so if you look at a church okay so big but for me to have such a big church i have to be growing in the lord so i should be able to teach i should be able to preach i should be able to spend time in god's presence many many hours i need the wisdom of god right uh, to deal with people to deal with situations so then we go through all of that right uh, it is not you that makes the vision but it is the vision that makes you up how powerful that is it is not you who makes the vision now even though you dream big even though you have a vision the vision makes you meaning because of that vision these are the things i'm doing example look at athletes right uh i've used this i think before you know uh andre agassi who is a very famous tennis player from the age of 6 he had one vision what to play in wimbledon the highest form of uh, you know uh, in his sport the highest level of uh, victory that you can win is the wimbledon from the age of 6 he had one vision to play tennis and to be in wimbledon now many people will say many things to him it didn't bother him why because that vision was there so the vision made the person the vision makes you if you don't have a vision what will happen what does the bible say those who don't have a vision lacks direction no where to go wake up in the morning i don't know what to do no you should be you should must have a vision so what you can see you can handle god calls things that are not as if they are there romans 4:17 what you can see you can have but now that is the spiritual aspect the natural aspect is doing all the work if you see yourself leading worship front of thousands of people good but we need to do the work we need to prepare sing whatever learn an instrument uh, you know learn how to sing uh, you know how to write songs whatever it is so visions and dreams are the language of the holy spirit and we need to keep dreaming it we need to keep dreaming it right you know, some of the things i do is I, i i keep looking at you know right now our church location has a it's probably a 300 seater auditorium right so we are about 120 people every sunday so i i picture one day this auditorium will be full and right? it's a picture i have i keep dreaming i keep seeing it even when i preach i i i feel i i keep telling myself okay one day it's going to be full many people are going to come now just me having that dream is it enough no so we have to do events we have to have good follow up new people come to church of good follow up system a lot of things are involved right to have a strong desire for a large growing church now if you have the desire if you have the zeal you will begin to work in it if you don't have the desire you don't have the zeal we won't work right very simple the desire and the zeal makes us to work tirelessly you know it doesn't look like work you get what i'm saying right so for example if you if you tell somebody hey 
If you tell a runner, get up at 5 a.m. and you know you have to run, you start your start your practice. He's not going to cry and say, "Hey, what is this? Why are you send? Why are you? Is it, will he tell the coach? Why are you sending me to run so early in the morning? No, he'll be excited. One day, I have to win that 200 meters race or the 100 meters race. If I want to do well, I need to do it. I need to work tirelessly. So he's excited to do it. It's not a burden. He's not dragging himself. The moment a person is dragging himself to do something, take a break or quit what you're doing. Very, very clear about it. Right? If you feel you have lost the desire or the zeal for something, either take a break or stop doing what you're doing. Because it's going to be, you'll not have any fruit if you're doing something just because people are telling you to do it. Right? Have a strong burning desire for your church. Three, engage in continuous prayer and spiritual warfare. Very important. Prayer for revival. Prayer is what breaks the chains of the enemy. Bring in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the let prayer, a praying church is a strong church. It's a very strong church, right? We must enjoy praying. We must never consider praying as a burden. Now listen, praying involves also the natural. Right? Your body is involved. You're using your mouth. You're using your senses. Your your speaking. Your you know your natural body is involved. But if we have a desire to grow closer to God, if we have a desire to know Him, to walk in His ways, prayer doesn't become burdensome. It's not like a task. Oh man, Friday. Fasting, prayer, three hours, who's going to pray? Now, the moment that attitude comes in, that's from the enemy. You need to push it away. You need to tell yourself, no, it's only three hours. Or it's only two hours, whatever, right? one or two hours. But I want to do this because prayer is what gets me to where I have to get to. Remember the vision? Thousand people in church is not going to come automatically. Listen, Jesus says, if you're faithful and small, I will give you bigger things. If we are not faithful and small, how can we expect bigger things? Right? So uh, the power of prayer makes it easy for us to stand in a place, where, especially in leadership. If one thing I've learned is if I try to do something in leadership without prayer, I will fail. Because we need the wisdom of God. We need the protection of God. We need to be able to, you know, to lead a church. It's not easy. There's, there's a lot of things involved, but it's a joy. It's not like, oh man, I have to get up and lead a church now. 100 people will share all their problems. I have to sit and listen to it. No, it's not a burden. You, you, when you engage in prayer, you engage in spiritual warfare. It, you know, you're, you, you're, you're in zeal. You say, hey, don't worry. I'll pray for you. We'll pray as a church. Whatever sickness, whatever challenge you're going through, God is going to help you. Right? Now imagine we go to Jesus and we say the same thing over and over again. Jesus is like, how many times to tell this guy? You know, he's praying the same thing. Will Jesus do that? Will he do that? Will he be grumbling? Yes or no? No. Right? The same way, engage. Now, if I'm not a praying person, how will I be able to put that into my church? Will I be able to communicate that to the church? Yes or no? Tell me. If I'm not praying, can I tell the church everyone should pray? I can tell, but will they listen? I'm gonna have, it's not going to hold value, right? So, continuous prayer and spiritual warfare. Fourth one, maintain strong faith in God. You must maintain faith in God. Now, faith is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. How many of us know Hebrews 11.1? 1? We must know this, right? Thank you. We must know this. Faith is the substance of things 
hoped for. Nowhere is it mentioned faith is a feeling. No. Faith is something that we do not see, yet we believe. So maintain strong faith in God. Things that we do not see. Yes, God, one day you will do it in my life. You will do it in my ministry. When you face many difficulties in church growth, we must stand on the word of God and trust what God is saying. What does his word say? His word says, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So, as in your personal life, you maintain strong faith in God, then you'll be able to communicate this to the church. The, the emphasis of God's word. And one thing that we always do in, uh, in APC is, if you've noticed, word takes number one priority. Yes or no? Right? It's always word. Even if it's a 15-minute meeting, one, just one word to encourage. Because it's the word that will encourage, build faith. Oh, nothing else. Right? It's just a word. The word of God is what can build faith in people's lives. So you have, as a leader, you have to you know, be, have that faith to understand what God's word is. Then you'll be able to communicate it to others. Right. So, for example, you start a local church, you start the first Sunday and then you begin to, uh, you know, every Sunday you meet and imagine you have 15 minutes of the word every day. Or 20 minutes message. Now, I wouldn't say it's right, but I wouldn't say it's wrong also. Now, in 20 minutes, there's not much you can teach. Now, we must understand, see, people are meeting once in a week. 52 Sundays in a year, apart from cell groups and all of it. But main, 52 Sundays in a year. In 52 Sundays, if I'm preaching 20 minutes, what will I communicate? It's not enough. Now, I must be able to know, understand that all of these people, maybe 100 people sitting in church, many of them don't know the word. Many of them are at different levels of faith. If I keep going to them and saying, you know, build your faith, build your faith a thousand times, there may not be any, uh, you know, response to that. But if we preach the word, we begin to minister the word effectively, faith will come automatically in their heart. Right? So we need to maintain as a church, as a, as a leader, strong faith in God. So one thing we do at ABC is 45 minutes of the word. It's okay even if you go extend a little bit. It's all right. Word, because it's the word that can build people. You've got youth sitting there. Now, they don't know so many things. right? They want to learn or they want, they're just hearing a message after a long time. In 20 minutes, if, I give a, if we give a sermon, I want to help them. They need something more. They really need to dig deep into God's word. You know, yesterday after service, one, one couple, they, were, they had come first time to church and they said, it's interesting to see that as a church, you spent you know, more than 45 minutes on a sermon on end times. I said, it's a four-part series. Four-part series. He was surprised. He said, not many churches do that. And I said, why? Churches must do that because it's the word of God. And the word of God builds faith in our heart, right? So uh, we must do that. Fifthly, maintain close fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in the church. It is the Holy Spirit who builds the church. The Holy Spirit is our senior partner. We must depend on him. We, you know, very, very important. We are called to develop an intimacy with the Holy Spirit. We need, we, you know, when we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, we will see the work of the Holy Spirit. A, a, a church without the power of the Holy Spirit is a dry church, is a dead church. Really. And see, remember, even if you preach the word, it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that can minister that word to people. If you're praying for healing, you're praying for deliverance, it is the work of the Holy Spirit doing it. It's not about me. 
It's not about the leader in the church. Right? So what's important here? We must develop an intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Now, you learned last year in Holy Spirit class, right? How do we develop an intimacy? We, we spend time with Him, spend time reading the Word. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a person. He uses our emotions. He uses our uh, you know, five senses. So we speak to Him. We ask Him. Uh, he is like a river. He just begins to flow. So many things, so many aspects of the Holy Spirit. We have to develop the intimacy. Now, the Holy Spirit is already residing in us. Right? Now, I can do a lot of things without the help of the Holy Spirit. So, for example, we have supernatural hour. I can take the guitar, I can sing three, four songs. Nothing. Nothing will happen. Wait, you know, we, I can just do it, cover up the type. That is three songs. Now, if I'm depending on myself, of course, the song, God is sovereign. He can still speak. But if the songs are not anointed of the Holy Spirit, they're not going to minister to the people. It's just going to be a three songs. You, get, you understand what I'm saying? Right. Now, God is above that. God can, if God wants to minister to somebody, he will do it. He's above what I am doing. Right? But he expects us to develop that intimacy with the Holy Spirit. We must recognize the work of the Holy Spirit. We must allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to manifest in the church. Firstly, as a leader, we must believe it. If I don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how will I be able to teach it in the church? And how can I expect the Holy Spirit to manifest the gifts? It's not going to happen. right? So. We must understand, we must recognize who the Holy Spirit is, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, teach it, begin to teach the church to grow in these things. That's why um, I think it's every first Sunday at all locations we have baptism of the Holy Spirit. So after service, anyone who wants to be baptized of the Holy Spirit can come. Then we'll just you know teach them a simple from the word, what does the Bible say? Pray over them and you know, encourage them to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. All of this in maybe 30, 40 minutes. Now we're giving that option to people. Right? Again, we give well, we have the weekend school of manifesting the gifts of the spirit, right? Uh, weekend school on healing and deliverance. So many weekend school of understanding the prophetic. All of this is so that the church understands that, you know, especially at APC, the people understand that we are a church that will flow in all these gifts, and you can learn it and you can grow in it. Is that okay? Right? So we must develop the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we must develop a partnership with the Holy Spirit in all our activities. So we ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is this something that I should do now? Or should I wait? Is this something that... Now, remember, when you start a church, you will be making all the decisions. Eventually, most of the important decisions you will be making. So at that time, you need the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation. You need it. right? So you partner with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, tell me what, what I should do. Now, we know the Holy Spirit is not going to write down and tell you what to do. But He can minister to you through your word, through the word. He can minister to you through a dream, through a vision, a stirring in your heart. Any way He can minister to you. Right? Thirdly, we should facilitate the transportation of the Holy Spirit to bringing the love and the grace of God to us and take our prayers and supplications to God. Finally, we must. We should also remember that we are united with the Holy Spirit, so we are no longer individuals, meaning we are separate from the Holy Spirit when it comes to our personal lives and in leadership. He's always with us. He's always there, 
we can always ask him and he will always give us the wisdom right now remember this as leaders especially in pastoral leadership you you and i will make may make mistakes right now just because we made a mistake we may have said something done something made a decision in a wrong way doesn't mean that you know the holy spirit gave us the wrong decision or the wrong, wrong. he can never be wrong but sometimes god allows us to make our decisions to see whether this person is he willing to come in line or come in obedience to what we want to do to what i tell him to do no, one second somebody wants to join okay so so it's okay to make mistakes but i love god to go back to god and i love god to you know go through and to repair those mistakes to restore right um now let's go to the next point page 67 Preach to demonstrate God's power and meet needs and release blessings. Now, why are we preaching? Just so that people listen to us? No. Why are we preaching? Because we have to preach on Sunday? No. We are preaching because we want to bring heaven down on earth. Remember, this word is the most powerful word that you can speak of. This is not poetry. This is not some historical book. Yes, of course, history is there in it. This book, the Word of God, is the most powerful, the most accurate book that you will ever find. But the Bible itself said, the Word of God is flawless. There is nothing wrong in this book. God, you, did you really want to put numbers with all those people? Well, when the Holy Spirit thought it was needed, it's needed. Nothing is a waste or nothing is a waste of space in this Word of God. Everything is true. Everything is flawless. And when you and I preach, we when we preach the, the word of God, we can expect the power of God to come out of that word. And when the power of God comes, there's a release of miracles. There's a release of blessings. That is why the you know in Deuteronomy, Aaron gives that wonderful um, uh, you know the benediction, so, so to speak. He says, uh, the you know he prays over the people of Israel. He says. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Every time I say that, it's it's so powerful. It's, it's a release of blessings. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he grant you his peace. His shalom. Like what are we doing? We're pronouncing the word of God, which is a blessing. Right? Now, there are threefold blessings here mentioned here spiritual blessings, material blessings, blessings in health. So, number one, spiritual blessings. Let's take a few moments here. What are spiritual blessings? Paul writes and he says in Ephesians 1, he says, We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. That means what? Everything that Every gift of the Holy Spirit is available for us. Spiritual blessings include that we are sons and daughters. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are children of God. We are no longer slaves. We are no longer in bondage. We are righteous. We are justified. We are redeemed. We are blessed. We are victorious. All of these things are spiritual blessings. We don't, it's not a physical blessing. It's a spiritual blessing. How do you know you're sanctified, made holy? Through what Jesus did, through the word of God, yes. If we wear white shirt, white pan, are we holy? Okay, you can wear white, okay. It's good. 
But just because we wear, is it holy? Is it holiness? No, right? Holiness, sanctification is a spiritual thing that happens inside of us. Two, material blessings. All through the scriptures, we see that the Lord blessed the people of Israel. He provided, even their slippers did not tear off. Wherever they went, they got what they needed. God provided for them manna. There was the rock, which water just came out of it. They had water. Wherever they went, there was water. And we can testify to this, right? In our own lives. Hey, God provided for me material things. That's, that's part of his covenant. That's part of his blessings. I will bless. I will provide for you, right? Thirdly, blessings in health. Now, imagine we have spiritual blessings, we have material blessings. But if we don't have health, Again, in many places we see that in the Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus, is, God is reiterating and He's saying, I am the one who sustains you. I will heal you. I will restore you. I'll bring you back to a place of physical wholeness. Right? So all these three, spiritual blessings, that is who we are in Christ. Two, material blessings. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Three, blessings in health. So when we preach and demonstrate, uh, preach and minister the word of God, we can touch on these three aspects, spiritual, material, and blessings in health. Next one, we equip and engage believers in ministry. Now, something that we are learning as 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 in in local church and in many other topics here is learn to raise up other leaders as a church we cannot be in a place of okay i'm the leader i'm going to handle this no now some of you have raised your hands you said you're going to you know plant a church or raise up a look your own local church now the moment you start when you go back you may start the moment you start, within a year, you should already think who should who should take my place. Now you don't have to go telling them. You know, 20 years down the line, you only have to take it up. No, don't need to go and say anything. There's again wisdom, right? But you pray prayerfully raise up leaders, raise up people who will be there for the church, who will be there for the ministry. Raise up a strong team. Equip people in leadership. Right? Why are we doing Bible college? Why are we doing weekend school? Why are we doing conferences? We want to equip people. Now, now coming up is the crack conference, right? Uh, talking about song detailing and filmmaking. Now, is there any ministry in that? Uh, meaning, is it any to, anything to go into God's word and start reading and you know, all? Not much, right? But what we want to see is we understand that God has given all of us different kinds of gifts, different kinds of talents. And so we want to encourage people to use the gifts and talents that they have, you know, biblical with through biblical principles, in a biblical way. So now at this conference, it's going to be song detailing. Now, there may be people who know how to write, but they want to learn how to write more. How to, you know, there's a way of writing poems. There's a way of, it's a gift, right? Songwriting is a gift. Now, I have a cousin who is in Mumbai. I'll tell you it's a gift. Because she just goes and she'll write one, two paragraphs and she'll come out, it's a song. I said, how did you do this? It's just a gift. Right? She hardly knows a couple of chords. Maybe now she has learned over time, but. And her songs became very famous. All these songs are written when she was like 14, 15 years old. She just goes to her room, writes. It's a gift. It doesn't just come naturally. Right? But we are to equip people. Right? Now, for example, some of us may, may be good in um, music. 
So you equip people. Say, hey, you can learn this this way. Use these things. Maybe some of us are good at preaching. Some of us are good at uh, hermeneutics, preparing sermons. I know of one person. He he loves to prepare sermons, but he doesn't want to preach. But he likes to prepare. He prepare uh, sermons. Preaching he doesn't want to do, but his preparation is beautiful. I know people who are very uh, interested in, you know, learning more about the Holy Spirit. But some of them I know who, you know, have asked me, "Can you teach about the uh, the offerings in the Old Testament?" Now these are young people, 24, 25. I think really you want to learn this? I thought only I'm the weird person, but they want to learn, right? So, you, so we want to equip people in whatever God has called them to do. Now, when we do that, as a church, you will see that people are taking up responsibilities. People are growing in the things of God. So it's not, it's not like only preaching, teaching, preaching, teaching. No. We equip people to grow. You get what I'm saying, right? So we all have gifts. We all have talents. As a leader, we need to look at people, recognize their talent, give them opportunities, teach them, help them to grow, release them into their calling. Right? So with that, we, with all of these principles, we will eventually see church growth. Now remember, church growth happens in stages. So don't be in a hurry. Learn to trust God. And very important, another very, very important point is don't compare your church growth to somebody else's church growth. Oh, Pastor, I started in 2024. This guy also started 2024. Now, but in one year, he's got 300 people. In one year, I'm still stuck with 50 people. Why is this happening? Now, what are you going to gain by comparing? You'll gain one thing, discouragement, sadness, uh, questions to God. All that only will be gained. No, no need of it. If they are doing, if God has used that church to have 100 people or 500 people in one year, that's, that's their ministry. Leave it. Bless them. Now, you may be doing everything right. And you may be questioning God, why nothing is happening? It's okay. Learn to journey with God. Especially in a time and age that we are living in, we want everything quickly. God, two years, give me 200 people. 100 each year. So five years, 500 people. No, it doesn't work that way. If it is, good. But if it's not, learn to journey with God. Journey with Him. He's taking you. He's... He's, he's got a ministry for you. He's taking you through that season. Yeah. Step by step. Right? Now, the other person's journey is going to be completely different to your journey. Moses' journey was different. Joseph's journey was different. David's journey was different. Jonah's journey was different. Paul's journey was different. Peter's journey is different. Why didn't God choose Peter to be a light to the Gentiles? You go and start all the churches, do this great revelations that I've given you. No. Who's more famous, Peter or Paul? If you read the book of uh, Acts, and initially it was Peter. Everywhere Peter is there. Everyone talking about Peter. Paul himself is saying, like the, 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 the leaders of the church, Paul, you know, Peter and James. So let... God journey, you are journeying with God, let God do it His way. You don't go up to God and say, God, I want it like this, like this is. See, God knows your vision. Yes or no? God has put the vision. You, you have written down, okay, God, in 10 years, I want to see 500 people in the church. Good. God knows. He knows you've written it down. He knows you're praying for that. But if it doesn't come, don't go back to God and say, God, what happened? You gave me the vision, it's not happened. No. Who are we to question God? So we, we just say, God, if there are things that I must do, things I must not do. See, there, sometimes there, as a leader, no, there are things we are not doing. Sometimes there are things we are 
doing which we are not supposed to do. You understand? Right? We may be spending too much time on a certain aspect when God is saying, no, I want you to spend time here. Remember Moses? God told Moses. I don't know why I keep talking about this. God told Moses what? There's problems happening in the Israeli camp. People are fighting for silly things. Now Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes and says, what are you doing? I'm solving the problems. He took my food. No? He took my bed sheet. He has, he's, he's done this. He took my money. He's not giving it back. Now Moses is sitting and dealing with those problems. Jethro, his father-in-law, said, please don't do this. You choose some leaders. Let them handle it. You go speak to God. Go to the mountain. You have a big task ahead of you. You keep yourself for prayer and the things of God. Don't bother about all this. Wise, very wise decision. Otherwise, Moses would have got drained out listening to these people. What's more important, hearing from God and leading these million people to the land, to the promised land, or listening to their problems? So we need to understand what it could be times when we are doing something which God doesn't want us to do. But if you know that you're doing everything that God has asked you to do, trust God in that journey. Okay? Okay. Let's go to God's blueprint for a local church. Now, there are 10 perspectives for a single blueprint. Now, before we go ahead, why is a blueprint important? Yes. Thank you. Clarity. Can you say that in the mic? Blueprint uh, gives us a clarity on of what you want to do and how you want to do it. Yeah. Blueprint gives us a clarity of what you want to do, how you want to do it. And one more, I'll add one more point to that. And what is the end result that you will see? When you go to an architect, say, I want to build two floors. I want to build a school. This is how the classroom should be. This is a first floor will be auditorium, few office. Uh, sorry, ground floor will be auditorium, office. First floor will be classrooms. So you go to the architect. What does the architect do? He'll go back home and he'll say, okay, what's he'll you know, he'll bring out a paper and he'll start, okay. He'll make a blueprint. This is how we can do it. This is your one acre land. This is how. It looks good for you. And he'll put all the measurements. So when the when he's doing the blueprint, he'll put the measurements. Auditorium is this big. Here are the pillars. Right? The steps will be here. Right? And here are the classrooms. In each classroom, the size will be this much, 10 by 20. Uh, everything will be mentioned in the blueprint. Now he'll come and give it to you. So this is the blueprint. Your school will look like this. Are you okay with it? Now you have the, it's not like the blueprint is the end. Now you have the opportunity to tell, hey, no, you know what? I thought, you know, the church is facing, it's looking like it's facing east. Can you make it face northward so that when people enter, they enter into the field? Or you may say, no, let them enter into the school building and behind that we'll have the field, this playground. Whatever it is. So the architect goes back and he makes the changes. Okay, what about this? Now, when we agree to the blueprint, and he said, okay, carry on. We're going to start with this. Now, after the building is done, do we go back to the architect and say, who told you to do it like this? I never said this. The architect will say, what do you mean you never said this? This is the blueprint. This is what, what, what is it? This is what we have discussed. What we have discussed is what is built. So the same way, God has a blueprint for the church. Who's the church? You and I are the church. Now we're going to look at the local church, right? So of course we know that we are the church, but the local church, as a local church, God has a blueprint. That means when God sees the church, he expects it to look like this. When we see a building, we expect the building to look like this. Right? Now, 
example, the classrooms should be four classrooms on the left side, four classrooms on the right side. Right. So as you go up the first floor, four on the left, four on the right. So when the, the real building is completed, it should look like that. Oh, yes. So you, you have the blueprint. Yeah, I had put door one, door two, door three, door four. These are the four classrooms, four classrooms the other way. So this is correct. The same way, when God has a blueprint, imagine the Lord Jesus' blueprint for the church will be the best blueprint. No need for any changes. He knows this is the best. So what are those blueprints? So we look into these, um, I think there are I mean, 10 blueprints, 10 perspectives for a single blueprint, right? So 10 perspectives in God's way to look at these, uh, uh, to look at the local church, right? Number one, the local church is the body of Christ, right? As his body, Colossians 1.18, let's read that. Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he may have the preeminence. Yeah. And he is the head of the body. Here the church, the local church, he's, right, is referred to as the body. Now, as his body, our life and identity flows from him. Individually and collectively. Our life, our identity flows from him. He is the body, right? Our identity is not our denomination or our doctrine. Our identity is Jesus and you know what he is doing in our lives. It flows out of him. Remember, all of you, you are part of APC Bible College, but that's not your identity. Your identity is you are a son and a daughter of God. That's your identity. Out of that identity flows all the other things. If you become a pastor or an evangelist, worship leader, your identity is not any of those. Your identity is you're a child of God. And then comes all of the other things. So as his body, our life and identity flows from him. Two. As his body, we represent Jesus, we reveal Jesus. Shall we read that verse? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, a fullness of him who fills all in all. Mm. Very important. As his body, we represent Jesus. We reveal Jesus. Can you think of this? You and I are the salt of the earth. Right? Here's what, there's a, there's a very good author, I forget his name, but he said, there are five Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. And sometimes nobody will read the first four. They will read only the fifth one. You are the gospel, meaning you are the light. You and I represent Jesus. We reveal Jesus wherever we go as his body. So Christ has to be seen accurately and portrayed by the church, uh, you know, portrayed by the church to the world. And we represent him to the world. Whenever we hear of these you know, things of great leaders falling because of character issues, sexual immorality, caught in adultery, money laundering, and um, all these things that are happening. It is, it is a black mark to the church. You understand? Right? Because, okay, like, hey, look at him. He's doing ministry. Look what has happened to him. Look at what happened to the... That's why these Christians are like this becomes a black mark to the church. So remember, we represent him. We are called to walk in light as he is in the light. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue from here.